Hi everyone, my name is Piotr Sarna and today I'll talk about LibSQL. I'm currently a staff software engineer at Chisel Strike, but I've spent a few precious years contributing to SillaDB, part of it as a maintainer. I'm also partially responsible for the SillaDB Rust driver project, and right now my main responsibility is LibSQL. What is LibSQL? Uh, it's a fork of SQLite, a famous libra library implementing a full-featured uh, lightweight SQL engine coded in C language. Uh, SQLite is a rock-solid project deployed to billions of devices, even if you count uh, smartphones only. Uh, it also has a very specific view on open source. Uh, its code is open and avail available as public domain, uh, but the project is explicitly not open contribution. Uh, instead, it has a small set of experts taking care of the whole project. Uh, that improves stability, but contributions have value as well. And that's why we decided to fork the Rock Solid Foundation and start maintaining it, uh, being fully open to external contributions. Uh, in particular, we're interested in using SQLite uh, in cases it wasn't originally designed for. Uh, by the way, there's an official web page called Appropriate Uses for SQLite, and it makes sense on its own, uh, but we still want to go beyond it. Uh, that includes using it in a distributed environment, particularly edge computing. Mm. <clears throat> We also push Rust into the code base, as it is not only a safer language, but also one that makes contributions more likely to happen due to Rust's uh, ever-raising popularity. Uh, a fair part of this presentation is actually going to be an introduction to SQLite architecture, because uh, this knowledge is simply needed to fully understand our motives for creating a fork uh, and why we decided to extend it with certain features. Uh, SQLite, uh, contrary to other database systems offering SQL interface, uh, is not client-server architecture. Uh, instead, uh, it's simply a library of functions uh, one can use to maintain a local database uh, stored in a regular file or sometimes a few files, which we'll learn in, in the next few slides. Uh, SQLite is a zero configuration system. Uh, while it allows you to tweak tons of settings to optimize for your particular use case, uh, it also works uh, out of the box. Uh, this great developer experience is one of the things that made it so popular. Uh, the other thing is extensive test coverage, which makes uh, the database very reliable. Uh, SQLite has a modular architecture that fits well on a single slide. Uh, this image is actually taken straight from SQLite docs. Uh, SQLite is extremely self-contained. Uh, it ships with its own tokenizer and parser, which translate SQL source code to, to dedicated bytecode, also invented at SQLite. Uh, this bytecode runs on a virtual machine implemented in SQLite, and this virtual machine uses uh, the backend implementation for input-output, a B3 layer, which lays on top of a pager layer, which lays on top of the operating system interface. Uh, independently, there's a set of helper programs, various utilities, and lots of tests. The top backend layer uh, is a B3 implementation based on the algorithm description from The Art of Computer Programming, uh, a well-known set of books by Donald Knuth. Uh, there are actually two implementations, one specialized for being indexed by an integer and one for secondary indexes where a key can be just arbitrary bytes. A pager is the only mechanism B3 uses for storing data. A pager is conceptually a simple structure. You can use it to read a page of data or write pages of data. Uh, internally, it gets more complex because it also includes an implementation of page cache, journaling, locking, and so on. But from a distant perspective, it's a simple module that gives you access to pages of fixed size. VFS stands for Virtual File System. Uh, it's not the one from Linux kernel, but the naming is not coincidental. Uh, SQLite's VFS is an abstraction for operating on files. Uh, initially, it was created simply to provide support for multiple operating systems, Linux, Windows, Mac, and so on because each of those has different ways of accessing hardware and the different file system implementations. Uh, later, it turned out that this layer of abstraction is useful for many other things, uh, for instance, providing encryption, compression, auditing, backups, checksumming, replication, you name it. Uh, virtual file systems are pluggable in SQLite, 
so users are free to load their own implementations dynamically without having to recompile the whole project, which is very convenient. The VDBE, the Virtual Database Engine, uh, implements the virtual machine that runs the bytecode to which all SQLite queries get compiled. Internally, VDBE is register-based and it simply executes database operations one by one uh, using the registers, just like a CPU would do it. SQLite also has an explain statement that works a little differently than what you could expect based on other database systems. Uh, it doesn't show you a high-level query plan and instead uh, prints the human readable version of the bytecode. Uh, from the output, you can clearly see what the virtual machine is going to do and when, uh, and it's deterministic, which makes debugging quite easy. And now, <clears throat> most database systems have a notion of transactions, which is an atomic unit of execution uh, consisting of one or more statements. SQLite has multiple types of transactions in various dimensions. For instance, there are read transactions and write transactions. Also, each transaction can be deferred, immediate, or exclusive, and that defines how soon the locks are obtained. Uh, an important thing to notice is that a statement in SQLite is always executed in a transaction. There's no such thing as running a statement outside of a transaction. Uh, instead, when a user requests a single statement to be executed, this statement is wrapped in an implicit single transaction. Uh, contrary to what other database systems may offer, uh, transactions in SQLite can't be nested in one another. Uh, there exists a mechanism for rolling back to a previously saved point in a transaction. It's called a save point. And then instead of a full rollback, one can roll back to a predefined point in, inside the transaction and try executing it again. Uh, now we're diving into more interesting bits. Uh, historically, the only journaling implementation in SQLite was a rollback journal. Uh, the way it worked was as follows. Uh, during a write transaction, before any page is written to the main database file, it, uh, it first gets copied to a rollback journal. Then, if the transaction commits, uh, the journal can be deleted or ignored. And during rollback, pages from the journal can be copied back to the main database file. They would simply overwrite whatever the transaction tried to write before. Later, a new journaling implementation was added, a write-ahead log, also known as wall. It uses an opposite idea. Pages are never written directly to the main database file during a transaction, but instead, they land into a new file, the write-ahead log. On rollback, the main database file is left intact because nothing, nothing was written to it in the first place, and pages are evicted from the log. Uh, on commit, nothing really happens immediately because reads are performed both from the main database file and the log. Uh, that's neat, but there's a price, and the write-ahead log would keep growing indefinitely if it's never truncated. To remedy that, there's a checkpoint operation which compacts the log back into the main database file. There are multiple types of checkpoints. You can make a partial checkpoint that doesn't block readers, or a full checkpoint which does, or even more complicated checkpoints that also block writers. Uh, but uh, these uh, stronger checkpoints are in turn guaranteed to reclaim all of the storage space. That makes the flow a little more complicated, but checkpoints are generally done automatically and their frequency, their frequency can be configured so that they don't interfere with user workloads. A quite important feature of wall journaling mode is its concurrency. Uh, the original rollback journal forced the writer to take an exclusive lock, preventing any readers from reading the database. Wall, however, allows readers to coexist with a writer because the main database file is never written to directly. The log only grows with new pages being appended to it, uh, so readers can always re remember a snapshot of the database by remembering a particular offset of the write-ahead log and never read past that offset. This is a huge benefit for concurrency, especially for uh, read-intensive workloads that only occasionally get a potentially long write transaction. And even more, uh, an, an even more interesting feature that isn't merged upstream yet uh, is a new flavor of transaction, begin concurrent. Uh, that only works in wall journaling mode, and it lets multiple writers continue in parallel using optimistic locking. Uh, 
it basically means that uh, once a concurrent write transactions the transaction wants to commit uh, it needs to check if the pages it touched were not modified by any other concurrent transaction if they weren't it's safe to commit if they were the transaction needs to roll back unfortunately uh, SQLite also has an interesting way of dealing with transaction conflicts. Uh, the decision is pushed to the user. Uh, transactions don't block. They return a special error code, SQLite busy, and uh, give control back to the user. Alternatively, users can register their, their own callbacks, which define how to react when it's not possible to obtain any deadlock. It can be a simple busy timeout or any kind of complex logic that users just implement themselves. Uh, SQLite is uh, quite opinionated in their documentation on what uh, constitutes a great use for SQLite and what might not be the best idea. Uh, still, it's uh, so tempting to try and distribute this architecture that uh, multiple projects already tried to accommodate the library for distributed systems. RQLite and DQLite uh, tried with Raft, the consensus algorithm. Uh, the first one treats each SQL statement as uh, a separate log entry and distributes that. And the second one distributes pages, performing a few mild hacks to distribute the write ahead log. Uh, then there's Lightstream, a well known solution for replicating the database in the background to S3 compatible storage. Uh, there's also a flavor of it, LightFS, trying to uh, leverage a user space file system for the, for the purpose. Uh, there's also Vernui, uh, an interesting project that replicates to S3 compatible storage and allows having distributed read replicas. Uh, there's also MV SQLite, which injects the power of Foundation DB, which is a distributed key value store, uh, to SQLite by replicating the pages uh, and introducing multi version concurrency control as well as optimistic locking. Uh, finally, mm, we are working on SCULD distributed libsql uh, with multiple backends, uh, including one that cooperates with MVSQLite and with support for read replicas too. Now, finally, a few slides on actual libsql. Uh, we've already made uh, progress to add features that facilitate using libsql in distributed systems and already got valuable contributions from the community, as well as lots of feature requests and discussions. One big thing introduced uh, in LibSQL is a virtual write ahead log. Uh, similarly to how VFS is a virtual interface, we wanted to hook into the wall journaling mode. Uh, let's see on a diagram uh, what can be overridden and when, uh, when implementing a virtual wall. Uh, the write path in SQLite in a wall mode is quite straightforward. Uh, when pages need to be stored, it's done within the write transaction. Uh, pages are appended to, appended to the write ahead log, and then the transaction can be committed or rolled back. With virtual wall, when pages are appended, we could do virtually anything with them. Cache them, replicate them to remote storage, compress, encrypt. Uh, overwriting the callbacks for starting and ending a write transaction also allows the developers to implement their own locking mechan mechanisms, including uh, forms of distributed locks. The read path is a little more complicated. Uh, here's one of the examples. Uh, a read transaction is started, and then the first call to wall is a question whether page number n exists in wall. If it does, wall returns an identifier of a newest frame that holds data for this page. This identifier can later be used to access page contents, and after that, a transaction ends. If the page is not found in wall, it's instead read from the main database file. And this opens a very interesting possibility for keeping the main database file as a small local cache where some of the recent pages are stored while the rest of the pages are kept in remote storage, for instance, something compatible with S3. That's especially useful uh, in edge computing because local storage tends to be really small in this environment and on the other hand, a small local cache would uh, make lots of user workloads faster. Uh, we've already started working on a few projects based on virtual wall. One of them is a use case similar to Lightstream, which offers continuous replication of the database file and its write ahead log to S3 compatible storage. Uh, 
Uh, we're also planning to add distributed read replicas on top of that, also based on the same virtual wall implementation. And that feature is implemented as part of Schooled, our distributed layer. Uh, one of the concurrency schemes uh, applied to distributed databases is optimistic locking, which was already mentioned before in this presentation. Uh, in this model, multiple writers are allowed to continue their operation in parallel, but before they commit the, the changes, a conflict check is performed. If a transaction can be committed without conflicting with any other concurrent write, it's simply done. Uh, if there's a potential conflict, a transaction fails and should either be retried or rolled back. Uh, SQLite was not designed with optimistic locking in mind, at least not from the start, uh, so there are some issues with it. First of all, SQLite allocates database pages in a free list implementation, which often needs to touch lots of pages just to update the metadata. Uh, that creates unnecessary contention and makes it more likely for concurrent transactions to fail. In order to prevent that, LibSQL is going to allow uh, overriding the allocation method for free pages so that users can provide their own mechanisms with better characteristics. Secondly, uh, SQLite tables usually have a special row ID column, which acts as the primary key. Uh, that column can be explicitly omitted uh, if, you, if you create a table, but if it is present, then it's a rather um, simple auto-incrementing counter. Uh, that's also a major sort of source of contention, because uh, if two parallel transactions want to add a new row, they are likely to get the same row ID number allocated, and that immediately creates a conflict. In order to avoid uh, hacky solutions, which exist in SQLite, uh, LibSQL simply adds a new keyword, random row ID, which allows users to create um, a table with row ID allocated in a pseudo-random fashion, making conflicts considerably more rare. Finally, we also introduced uh, dynamic user-defined functions uh, to LibSQL. SQLite also has user-defined functions, but they need to be coded via programmatic APIs, so they are not as portable and secure as a good old create function statement. Uh, we run the functions on a WebAssembly engine, which is already becoming standard for embedded languages. And this talk is way too short to include details about our, our WASP integration, so if you are curious, uh, follow the link to our blog post, which contains more information on, on that particular integration. Uh, there are also more features we're after. Introducing multi-version concurrency control is one. Uh, exploring how we can introduce conflict-free replicated data types, so-called CRDTs. Uh, provide some official Rust bindings to make it easier to integrate with existing Rust projects and countless other ideas. Uh, finally, LibSQL is open source and open contribution, so I cordially invite everyone to join the community. All kinds of contributions are welcome. And that's it. Thanks, everyone.